जो जो खाएगा वही हम खाएंगे From the sands of Egypt to the mountains of Peru, our ancestors faced unimaginable challenges, including the quest for sustenance. So, let's talk about the 20 worst survival foods of ancient history. Number 20, hardtack. Imagine a biscuit so hard it could double as a frisbee. Well, that's hardtack for you. Sailors aboard long voyaging ships relied on this rock-solid sustenance for centuries. Why? Because it was cheap, easy to make, and practically indestructible. To whip up a batch of hardtack, all you needed was plain flour, water, and a pinch of salt. Mix it into a basic dough, flatten it, and bake it at a scorching 180 degrees Celsius. That's 350 degrees Fahrenheit for 45 minutes. Voila, you got a biscuit that could withstand a hurricane. But wait, there's more. Hardtack wasn't just baked once because it went through the oven two or three times to suck out every last drop of moisture. The result? A cracker so dry it could survive a desert trek. Hardtack had the flavor profile of cardboard. Seriously, it was like chewing on a tasteless brick. Soldiers during the American Civil War had to get creative. Some smashed it with rifle butts just to soften it up before dunking it in water or crumbling it into soups. And get this, there's an actual piece of hardtack from 1862 still intact in the Minnesota Historical Society's collection. Number 19, Melis Somos. Next up takes us to ancient Sparta. where warriors consumed a notorious dish known as melas somos or more colloquially black broth just imagine a concoction resembling a questionable attempt at mole sauce or less generously the aftermath of an unfortunate hospital <clears throat> accident what made it truly unappetizing a blend of blood salt vinegar and yes boiled pig's legs let's appreciate the irony here With perfectly good pig's leg at their disposal, the Spartans opted for this peculiar blend, leading one non-Spartan to famously remark, "Now I do perceive why Spartan soldiers encountered death so joyfully. Clearly taste wasn't their strong suit." It's fascinating how survival often dictates culinary choices. The Spartan warriors, known for their toughness, crafted a meal that mirrored their resilience. Boiled pig's legs aside, the inclusion of blood, salt, and vinegar left even the locals unimpressed. But let's not be too quick to judge. In times of scarcity, necessity often overrides culinary preferences. These ancient civilizations had to make do with what was available, even if it meant concocting dishes that would make us squirm today. Number eighteen, garum. Imagine a food so foul that the Romans banned its production within city limits due to its overwhelming stench. Yes, we're talking about garum, the fermented fish sauce that could clear a room faster than a thunderstorm. The process itself was a spectacle. Fish bits, guts and all, packed into stone tanks, submerged in salt water, left to ferment under the scorching sun for up to a year. No wonder it was strictly an outdoor activity. The modern palate, the idea of fermented fish sauce might not be entirely foreign, especially in Southeast Asian cuisine. But trust us, experiencing garum straight from the source is not for the faint of hearted. Believe it or not, the Romans adored garum. They slathered it on particularly everything they ate, elevating their dishes with its distinctive pungency. Forget garlic bread. Garum took olfactory senses to a whole new level. While garum might seem repulsive to our modern sensibilities, it was a staple in ancient Rome culinary culture. Number 17, pemmican. Pemmican, a staple in North American survival lore, is a simple yet indigenous concoction made primarily from shredded dried meat and animal fat. It boasts a perfect one-to-one -one ratio, ensuring a balance of sustenance and flavor. The process begins with small pieces of meat laid out under the sun to dry, later crushed or shredded into fine particles mixed with rendered animal fat. This blend is then molded into bars with an extra layer of fat to seal in freshness. 
What makes pemmican truly remarkable is its longevity. Stored in cool, shaded areas, it can withstand the test of time, making it an ideal provision for long journeys, especially in colder climates. However, once exposed to air, its shelf life dwindles rapidly, reminding us of the delicate balance between preservation and consumption. Dried jerky, pounded into dust or slivers, served as the primary protein source, offering substance and sustenance to the nomadic traveler. Rendered animal fat, the glue that binds it all together, provides essential calories for energy and endurance. Some people might not like the taste of pemmican. It's made from dried meat and animal fat, which some people find strange. The way it's prepared, like drying the meat and mixing it with fat, might not be appealing to everyone. But pemmican is more about being a useful food for survival than tasting good. It can keep people fed and energized in tough situations, even if it's not the tastiest option. Number 16. Blood and Offal In olden times, people in traditional communities made sure to use every part of an animal for food. This included using blood and different organ meats, known as offal. They might cook blood into a pudding or mix it with other foods to make a healthy meal. Awful, like liver, kidneys, and intestines, were eaten because they had important nutrients that regular meat didn't have. Some folks still like eating these foods today, but others find them gross. Despite the nutritional benefits and cultural significance attached to these foods, modern taste and perceptions vary widely. While some individuals continue to appreciate and enjoy traditional dishes featuring blood and offal, others may find them unappealing or even repulsive due to cultural differences or personal preferences. Well, can you survive solely on this? Our ancestors agree with that. Using blood in food means people use blood in cooking, based on their beliefs and traditions. In many places, people mix blood with meat to make delicious light blood sausage or use it to thicken sauces. Sometimes, when there's not much food, they might preserve blood with salt or use it in soups. The blood comes from animals that people raise for food. They collect the blood and quickly use it or save it for later. In some places, people kill animals to get their blood for cooking. But in other cultures, eating blood is not allowed. Different cultures have different rules about eating blood. Some people think it's okay, while others don't like it at all. Number 15. A Pishin Jelly It seems that people in the past, even up to fairly recent times, were determined to combine meat and gelatin, despite the unappetizing result. While traditional gelatin is indeed made from cooked animal products, it's quite a stretch to justify suspending meat and organs in it resembling something out of a strange video game or horror film. One infamous example of this odd culinary concoction is Apician Jelly, found in the ancient cookbook Apicius. The recipe begins innocently enough with a list of herbs, but then takes a turn for the worst with the addition of chicken and other animal sweetbreads, which are peculiar organs like the pancreas. These ingredients are then covered with gelatinized broth and left to harden in the snow. As if that weren't bizarre enough, the recipe then suggests adding a sauce as if that could salvage the situation. These days, our palates may cringe at the thought of suspending organs and gelatin, but it serves as a fascinating glimpse into the culinary experimentation of bygone eras. So, the next time you enjoy a modern dish, spare a moment to appreciate how far we've come from the days of a pish and jelly and its peculiar combinations. Number 14. Insects As you know, throughout history, humanity has faced countless challenges. Survival often depended on resourcefulness and adaptability. Among the most intriguing solutions, insects. Insects have long been a protein source for humanity, especially in regions where alternatives are scarce. Creatures like crickets, grasshoppers, and ants weren't just critters, they were delicacies. Ancient societies collected and savored them, whether raw or cooked. Some even grounded insects into flour for bread and other culinary creations. Before you squirm, consider this. While insects sustain many, they spark revulsion in others. 
What seemed like a feast in one culture could be a famine in another. It's all about perspective. From roasting to grinding, ancient societies experimented with various techniques to make insects palatable. Some cultures even transformed them into flour for baking bread or crafting savory dishes. Insects represented a crucial survival strategy. Their abundance and nutritional value were unparalleled, especially during lean times. However, societal norms often dictated what was deemed acceptable or repulsive. Number 13. Rotten Food Long ago when fridges didn't exist, people had to be clever with food. They found a surprising solution – eating rotten food. Some folks couldn't store food well, so they let it go a bit bad. They discovered that when food rots in a certain way, like meat, veggies, or grains, it can still be okay to eat. So just imagine meat getting older, veggies changing, and grains turning different. It might sound odd now, but back then, it saved a lot of hungry days. People back then knew that if they let food go a bit bad, it could taste better and last longer. They were smart about making food last. Even though some food smelled strange, it was a big help for those who didn't have much. But not everyone liked the idea of eating food that was a bit off. Some thought it was gross. Number 12. Trench Cake Before, people made simple cakes with flour, honey, spices, and fruits. These cakes were the energy boosters for hunters and soldiers, dating back to ancient Roman times. By the late 1800s, fruit cakes were everywhere in the British Empire. They became even more popular during World War I. Families sent trench cakes to soldiers fighting in Europe. Back then, getting ingredients was hard, so the recipe didn't have eggs. Instead, they used vinegar and baking soda to make the cake rise. In the war, every hen was supposed to help out, and people who had chickens had to send their eggs to military hospitals. The eggs were then given to injured soldiers to help them recover. The World War I trench cake recipe revealed how creative people became and lifting spirits with homemade treats. It was made specifically to be sent to soldiers in the trenches. Instead of butter, they used dried fruits to keep the cake moist for a long time during its journey to the front line. With very little flour which was rationed, the cake remained small and dense, perfect for fitting into a parcel to send to the trenches. Eggs were also left out. Vinegar was used instead to help the cake rise. To keep fruit cakes fresh, people wrapped them in cloth soaked in alcohol. Then they wrapped them in plastic and put them in metal tins. This way, fruit cakes could last for many months. Number 11. Bog Butter for thousands of years, lovers of Irish dairy have been keeping their butter cool. Bog butter, an ancient discovery from Ireland, dates back nearly 3,000 years. It is a peculiar waxy substance that people buried in peat bogs for safekeeping. Over time, the practice was forgotten, leaving these buried treasures to their fate. In 2009, archaeologists stumbled upon a barrel of bog butter, remarkably intact despite its age. Although instead of the creamy texture it once possessed, it had turned into adiposir, a fatty white substance. Adiposir forms through the breakdown of fat in tissues by anaerobic bacteria. This find offers a fascinating glimpse into the culinary practices and preservation techniques of ancient Ireland, revealing how people safeguarded their food in the distant past. What's shocking is that until 2003, scientists and archaeologists weren't sure where bog butter came from. Researchers from the University of Bristol found that some samples of this butter were made from animal fat, while others were made from dairy products. Over time, bog butter deteriorated in appearance and flavor as the fat decomposes. It becomes hard, yellowish-white, resembling wax, and develops a cheesy smell. The cool, low-oxygen, high-acid environment of the bog made it perfect for preserving perishable food before modern refrigeration methods were available. The fat absorbs flavors from its surroundings, resulting in unique taste notes described as animal, gamey, mossy, funky, pungent, and salami. Number 10. Bronze Pot Chinese Food while building a new airport in Xi'an, China, workers found something surprising. 
they discovered a 2,400-year-old bronze cooking pot underground. It was still tightly sealed and filled with bone broth. Even though it was very old, the pot kept the broth inside. But the broth turned green because of the bronze rusting over time. It might not look nice, but this finding tells us about how people cooked long ago in China. It shows how smart our ancestors were at keeping their food. This discovery is a big deal because it tells us about ancient Chinese life and food. Food wasn't just about eating back then, it was also part of traditions and everyday living. The green color of the broth tells us about what happened to the ingredients over thousands of years. It helps scientists understand how people kept their food fresh in the past. Finding this pot makes us wonder about the people who made and ate the broth. What were their lives like? What other foods did they enjoy? This old pot connects us to the past and teaches us about Chinese food history. Number 9. Luke Fisk A classic Scandinavian dish called Luke Fisk is made with dried fish, usually cod, steeped in lye, a strong alkaline solution. The end product is a transparent, gelatinous fish with a distinct ammonia odor you won't ever forget. For ages, humans have faced the challenge of keeping food, especially meat and fish, fresh. It's vital to have a steady protein source, but fresh food isn't always available. That's why people came up with methods like freezing, canning, smoking, and pickling. In Mesopotamia around 3000 BC, folks started preserving meat by salting, drying, and storing it in oil. This was one of the earliest known ways to keep food from spoiling. By 200 BC, Greeks and Romans had really mastered the technique of salt curing, which helped preserve meat and fish effectively. These preservation methods were game changers. They allowed people to store food for long periods, making it easier to survive in times when fresh food wasn't around. It's fascinating how ancient civilizations figured out ways to tackle such a crucial problem like food preservation paving the way for the techniques we still use today. Early civilizations may not have understood the science behind it, but they were sharp observers when it came to preserving meat. They noticed that leaving meat exposed to moisture led to bacterial growth and a bad smell, attracting insects. However, they also saw that drying meat naturally made it last longer. Scandinavians in particular noticed this and started leaving cod, also known as stockfish, out in the freezing cold to dry. This method preserved the fish for years and was perfect for their seafaring lifestyle because it was lightweight and easy to carry. This ancient practice of drying cod is where Luke Fisk comes from. It's a delicacy among Swedes and stems from their early heritage of preserving fish. Even though they might not have known the science behind it, their observations and ingenuity paved the way for preserving food in ways that still influence us today. If you think that sounds bad, wait until you see how it looks and tastes. Loot Fisk has a slimy texture that makes it hard to cut with a fork and a bland flavor that needs a lot of butter and salt to make it edible. Some people even add bacon or cheese to mask the taste. Loot fisk is also disgusting that many Scandinavians only eat it once a year as a tradition or a dare. It's not surprising that loot fisk has been called the world's most revolting food by many critics and comedians. You couldn't pay anyone enough to try this fishy nightmare. Number 8. Possum Romans loved wine, but back then women weren't supposed to drink it. Legend has it they created a sweeter wine using raisins. Let's dive into the story and learn how to make it. Possum, a sweet wine from raisins, was a hit in ancient Rome. It wasn't just for sipping. People used it in cooking, too. Surprisingly, making possum involved soaking raisins in urine to help them ferment. Yes, you heard that right again. Urine. Yes, the ammonia in urine helped make the raisins sweet. The Greeks were big on wine, and when they set up shop in southern Italy, they brought their love for viticulture. Grapes thrived in the new colonies, and soon wine became a big deal for the Romans and others up north. Wine wasn't just a drink, it was part of fancy meals and even religious festivals like the Bacchanalia, honoring Bacchus, the wine god. 
Romans had rules about proper behavior called mas maiorum, which included women not drinking. But enforcing these rules was tough, especially in a huge empire like Rome. Despite the rules, wine remained a big part of Roman life, and women especially loved possum, a wine made with raisins. They even had their own version made with regular grape juice and raisins. Number 7. Surströmming Surströmming is a classic Swedish dish made of fermenting Baltic herring. When you crack open a can of surströmming, get ready for a strong smell that'll leave an impression. If you've seen any stinky fish challenge videos, chances are it's surströmming. This traditional fish dates back to the 16th century when Sweden lacked salt. Today it's famous for its odor, but fans swear by its delicious taste. In spring, small Baltic herring are caught, salted and left to ferment for a while before being packed into cans about a month before they're sold. The fermentation keeps going in the can, giving the fish its unique tangy flavor. Some might call it rotten, but enthusiasts appreciate the pungent aroma and tangy taste, which comes from the lactic acid enzyme in the fish's spine. It's definitely not your ordinary fish dish, but surströming has a special place in Swedish cuisine loved by those with adventurous taste buds. Number 6. Maggot Cheese Kasu Marzu is a unique Sardinian cheese crafted from sheep's milk. What sets it apart, for better or worse, is the live maggot colony it hosts. This is also the world's most dangerous cheese. If you were to examine cheese under a microscope, you'd discover that it's a living product. A myriad of microorganisms contribute to the aging process, making cheese alive in a sense. While it's a lengthy process to describe these organisms involved, cheese is undeniably alive during its affinage or aging. Interestingly, in the case of this particular Italian cheese, you don't need a microscope to see its living aspect. We're talking about Kazu Marzu, where the presence of maggots is visible to the naked eye. These maggots play a crucial role in its aging process, so indeed, this cheese is alive in a quite literal way. This cheese deliberately invites flies to lay eggs in it. Once hatched, the maggots munch on the cheese, turning it into a soft, gooey texture. Just imagine serving up a slice of cheese teeming with squirming maggots. Definitely not your typical cheese experience. While some might find Kasu Marzu horrifying, others might see it as a fascinating culinary tradition. It's certainly a cheese that sparks strong reactions and discussions wherever it's encountered. This cheese with maggots is not just banned in the US but also across the European Union due to health concerns. The larvae in the cheese have a startling ability to jump up to 15 centimeters when disturbed. This poses a serious risk to health because if the ingested maggots survive the stomach acids, they can cause severe intestinal damage. While this cheese is still crafted by hand, its intense nature doesn't win it many fans. It's worth noting that if you come across another cheese seemingly alive on the outside, it's not normal. This could be due to packaging issues like insufficient cooling or protection, which attracts flies to lay eggs. Number 5. Hakarl Greenland sharks hold the record as the world's longest living vertebrates, growing up to 24 feet long and often partially blind. Despite their impressive size, their meat is toxic when eaten fresh, causing severe discomfort. However, indigenous Vikings found a solution, burying the shark under rocks and dirt for weeks to neutralize the toxins. After excavation, the meat was hung to age further, resulting in hakarl, a device of delicacy among Icelanders. The uric acid in fresh Greenland shark gives it an ammonia-like smell. The soft white meat from the shark's body resembles cheese, while the reddish belly meat is chewier. Tasting experiences vary widely, with descriptions ranging from mild and fishy to strong like blue cheese. Most notably, the lingering aftertaste is often likened to urine. Hakarl is commonly washed down with a shot of Brennevin, creating a unique culinary experience deeply rooted in Icelandic traditions. Hakarl is a prized delicacy in Iceland, crafted from fermented Greenland shark. 
The process involves burying the shark meat underground for several months to ferment, after which it's hung to dry. This unique method results in a pungent and distinct flavor that some find adventurous to try. Hakaro holds a special place in Icelandic culinary tradition, offering a taste experience that's both traditional and polarizing. In Viking time, Greenland shark was traditionally fermented underground, while today the process mostly occurs above ground. An expert determines the readiness of the food by scent before it's hung to complete the breakdown process. Typically, it can be served after about six months of fermentation. This traditional method, rooted in Viking culture, highlights the historical significance of Hakarl, an Icelandic culinary heritage. Number 4. Rats People sometimes consume what may be considered disgusting or unconventional food to survive due to many reasons. Rats have historically served as a significant source of survival food in various cultures throughout ancient times. While the idea of consuming rats may seem unpalatable to modern sensibilities, their role as a food source was born out of necessity rather than choice. Rats, small rodents found in fields, barns, and sewers, served as a food source in times of scarcity or famine. People occasionally consume rats to supplement their protein intake. In places like Vietnam, known as Chuit, rat meat was prized for its flavor and texture, considered a delicacy. Rat meat was typically roasted, stewed, or fried until crispy and tender, often served with rice, noodles, or vegetables. Seasoning such as salt, pepper, ginger, garlic, or chili enhanced its flavor and aroma. Smoking, drying, or pickling rat meat allowed for its use in soups, salads, and sandwiches. Nutritionally dense, rat meat offered iron, fat, and protein, but its pungent musky flavor and hairy skin required careful preparation. Considered taboo in some societies and religions due to hygiene concerns, rat meat remained a contentious and forbidden food. Despite its challenges, rat dishes reflected the resourcefulness. Number 3. Blood Pudding Blood pudding, often referred to as black pudding, stands as a traditional dish with a rich history deeply rooted in various cultures around the world. Originating from ancient times, this culinary creation showcases the resourcefulness of utilizing every part of the animal in cooking. The process of making blood pudding begins with gathering fresh blood, often from pigs, and combining it with fat and grains like oats or barley. This blend creates a thick mixture that is then seasoned with herbs, spices, and sometimes onions or other flavorings, depending on the regional variations and personal preferences. Once mixed, the concoction is poured into casings and then cooked by either boiling, steaming, or frying until it solidifies into the distinctive sausage-like shape that characterizes blood pudding. The cooking process not only ensures the safety of the dish, but also enhances its flavor and texture, resulting in a savory and satisfying treat. Despite its somewhat unconventional ingredients, blood pudding has earned a place in the culinary traditions of many countries including Ireland, Scotland, England, Spain, France, and various Nordic regions. It is often enjoyed as part of hearty breakfast or served alongside other dishes as a flavorful accompaniment. The unique combination of ingredients gives blood pudding its distinctive taste, earthy, rich, and subtly spiced, with a satisfyingly dense texture. While some may be initially hesitant to try it due to its origins, those who do often find themselves pleasantly surprised by its deliciousness. In addition to its culinary appeal, blood pudding also holds cultural significance, symbolizing traditions, heritage, and the preservation of culinary practices passed down through generations. It serves as a reminder of the ingenuity and creativity of cooks throughout history who sought to make the most of every ingredient available to them. Blood pudding was a simple dish to make, and the ingredients were easy to find. Animals that were sacrificed or killed in arenas provided the blood, which was used in affordable foods like blood sausage and pudding. These dishes could be bought at the market, 
but the people who sold them were not considered very high in society. In the ancient cookbook of Apicius, there's a recipe that suggests mixing blood with egg yolks, spice, and nuts. Then, this mixture is put into an intestine and cooked until it's just right. Unlike the black sausages known in Britain, Roman recipes use onions to soak up the liquid instead of oats or other grains. This shows how different cultures had their own ways of making blood pudding, using what was available to them. Even though it might seem strange to us now, it was a common dish in many places throughout history. Number 2. Salted Fish Eyes In the preservation process of salting fish, it was common practice to leave the eyes intact. This resulted in salty, gelatinous eyeballs that were occasionally consumed as a source of nutrition. Despite their unconventional nature, fish eyes provided valuable nutrients and were occasionally included in meals, demonstrating the resourcefulness of utilizing every part of the fish for sustenance. While not widely consumed today, the tradition of consuming fish eyes reflects the historical practices of communities reliant on fishing for their sustenance, where waste was minimized and every edible part of the fish was used to ensure nutritional adequacy. In Western cultures, there's often a preference of keeping food at a distance with clean, prime cuts of meat typically found in fish markets and meat counters, but many parts of the world have a different approach. In several Asian countries where fishing is crucial, the entire fish is utilized in cooking. Tails and heads symbolize good fortune, and it's common for Chinese cooks to serve whole fish, reserving the eyeballs for esteemed guests. Russians, known for their love of soups, have yuca, a soup dating back to the 17th century, which features whole fish heads, including the eyes. In Spain, chefs frequently use fish eyes to thicken sauces and broths because they contain a natural gelling agent, adding viscosity and flavor. In Sri Lanka, families consume the entire fish, including the eyes, as a tradition to minimize waste and maximize nutrition. Actually, globalization has introduced these culinary traditions to the Western world, where new flavors and textures are gaining popularity. Menus now include ingredients that were once overlooked, reflecting a growing appreciation for diverse cuisines and culinary practices worldwide. Anyway, fish eyes boast diverse flavors and textures, influenced by their environment. Externally, fish eyes feature a delicate, sticky outer layer. Upon biting into them, a crunchy core akin to gum is revealed. Within the eyes lies a wafer-like texture with a rich flavor profile, bursting with umami-like taste sensations. Savor the gel-like spongy surface with closed eyes, letting your taste buds revel in the fatty goodness. Often likened to raw oysters, fish eyes are alternatively described as having a flavor akin to fish-flavored grapes. These nuances make them a unique and intriguing delicacy in culinary exploration. And number 1. Roasted Cat and Hedgehog During medieval times, Europeans displayed a penchant for culinary exploration, venturing beyond conventional meats to satisfy their palates. Roasted cats and hedgehogs found their way onto dining tables, highlighting the resourcefulness of medieval kitchens. Cats, often regarded as pests, were occasionally captured and roasted, while hedgehogs were hunted for their meat. These unconventional culinary choices exemplified the adaptability of medieval diets where individuals made use of available resources to sustain themselves. Such practices offer insights into the historical context of food consumption, showcasing the diverse array of ingredients and flavors that shaped medieval European cuisine. Hedgehog meat was valued for its high protein, fat, and mineral content, making it a hearty and nutritious meal in medieval times. However, its gamey, musky flavor and scent required either masking or appreciation by diners. Before cooking, the tough, spiky skin of the hedgehog had to be removed, adding to the challenge of preparing and enjoying this acquired delicacy. Beyond its culinary usage, hedgehog meat was believed to possess magical properties capable of healing ailments like rheumatism, toothaches, and even baldness. 
consequently, it was revered as a magical and therapeutic food imbued with mystical qualities. Additionally, the hedgehog's association with Pluto, the god of the underworld, and Diana, the goddess of the hunt, made it a symbol of good fortune and luck in medieval folklore. And there you have it, the 20 worst survival foods of ancient history. Let us know in the comments which survival food surprised you the most. Thanks for watching.